Good morning and welcome to our Zoom meeting with Shannon from the Langley Centennial Museum. This is our last Zoom session for this school year with the Centennial Museum. So thank you very much for giving us your time and sharing your expertise with us over the last couple months, Shannon. So you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, so for those who are watching the session later on, my name is Shannon. I am the Interim Arts and Heritage Educator for my new Centennial Museum. I am, however, just wrapping up my time with the museum and moving on to some other opportunities. So next year, next school year, hopefully you will see Lindsay, who's in maternity leave uh, position I am filling, take over these sessions. The Langley Centennial Museum has a huge, huge range of school programs, and we cover arts and science and history, and there's so much to see and learn at the museum. So hopefully we will continue sharing that with you in the fall. Um, meanwhile, Thank you for joining us all of these many weeks. This has been exceptional. I've grown very fond of these sessions and our regular kids who log in and their families and all of you who are watching this later. So um, we're gonna keep it shorter today, just about 20 minutes. We're gonna talk about art in the park. So uh, for those who are with us today, if I say the word art in the park, take a second and those who are watching this later on too, and just think about what does that mean? Maybe that there's art in a park. <laughs> but do you think, okay, so let me rephrase. If I said, go make us some art in the park, I mean, that could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what would be the first thing that comes to mind for you? What would be the thing that you would want to do? Probably like draw a tree or something that's from the park. Yeah, that's a great idea. So a lot of times we go around, and I know in Burnaby and a lot of other municipalities, they, they do, they advertise art in the park. But what that usually is, is people literally doing visual art in a park. So they're drawing, they're painting, they're sculpting, sculpting they're using nature to influence their, their sketches. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is a little bit different. So at the Langley Centennial Museum, we have a program called Art in the Park, but it's about environmental art. So not just using nature to inspire your drawing or your painting, but using nature itself to create art. So using natural objects only. So we're gonna start out, we're gonna watch just a quick 10 minute video. Um, this video was done by Helen, uh, our most senior art instructor at the Langley Centennial Museum. So if you're going out into the park, we're not just talking about taking your sketch pad and doing the drawing of a painting, but we're talking about using art to create, sorry, using nature to create natural art. So Helen is our most uh, senior art instructor. Um, she's been with us a long time. She teaches all of our art um, in addition to other instructors but she teaches all of our programs at the Langley Centennial Museum. And uh, we were so lucky that she got to make a little video for us showing what environmental art means. So we're going to watch this 10 minute video. We're going to talk about some other environmental artists, and then we're going to see how we can make environmental art ourselves. I'm Helen and I'm an Arts and Heritage Instructor with the Langley Centennial Museum in Fort Langley. I'm so thankful to be out in the fresh air and sunshine of Darby Reach Regional Park today. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this beautiful park is on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Katsi and Kwantlen Nations. Based on our Art in the Park environmental art program, I'm going to take you through how to create your own environmental artwork today, inspired by the land art created by British sculptor, photographer, and environmentalist Andy Goldsworthy. Andy Goldsworthy's work reminds us that nature isn't just what's on the other side of our front door. We ourselves are part of nature. So making art using only natural materials found on the land, like leaves, sticks, rocks, mud, sand, snow, and ice, 
is the most natural way of making art that we can engage in. And at times, it can even seem a little bit magical. The first thing we need to do is go for a nature walk. You can create land art in any environment and in any weather conditions. Remember, Andy Goldsworthy also used snow and ice in his land art. If you're in a regional or national park, it's best to stay on the path and pick up materials on the forest edge. Try to collect as many different textures, shapes and colours of materials that you can find already lying on the forest floor. Just remember, be careful not to touch poisonous or stinging plants. If you're not sure, ask the adult you're with or a park ranger. As you're walking along, make sure to take some time to stop and look around you. Allow yourself to be inspired by the environment you're in. You might also find the area where you want to create your land art. Once you've found that area, put everything you've collected onto the ground. Then just sit for a while to look more closely at the colors, shapes and forms in front of you. Play with the material. See what colors and shapes work well together. What materials bend, what materials break, what balances or what can naturally be stuck together. Most importantly, just have some fun with it. Andy Goldsworthy creates a lot of his work in spirals, lines, circles, arches, and holes. He also looks at how weather can change or break down his artwork over time. This could mean the sun melting the snow or ice, the wind blowing leaves away, or water running over sand or twigs and moving them. You may have collected a ton of different materials, but you don't have to use them all. Andy Goldsworthy often uses just one or two materials together. But choose materials you find interesting because of their color, shape, or texture. Then use the materials you've chosen to make a pattern, a circle, a spiral, wavy or straight lines, or just whatever comes to mind. There's really no right or wrong way to create art and you may choose to create something that you can develop further another time. Andy Goldsworthy often creates several versions of one idea. It's all about your own personal expression with the materials you're using and it's really important to enjoy the process. I like to create artwork that tells a story and what I'm creating today starts with an old rotting stump and many very bendy sticks. I'll let you decide what you think the story of my artwork might be.
worlds where the intentionally makes temporary environmental artwork. Artwork that will eventually decay or be broken down by the weather or animals as time goes on. So when he has finished his land art, he always records it by taking photographs and video too. Once you feel you've finished creating your land art, stand back and admire it from different angles. Take photos and videos if you can too. You can be proud that you've created unique land art that can be enjoyed by many people and your work is completely environmentally friendly. I hope I've inspired you to create your own land art. Thank you for watching and please remember to check out um, the other videos that we've created for Langley Centennial Museum. Have fun and stay safe. Bye. So about 10 minutes ago when I said, um, think about what art in the park could mean. And then Lacey's like, well, obviously we're just gonna do art in the park, which of course we should always try to get inspired by nature. We should always try to get outside. And uh, if you like doing art or even if you, maybe you don't know that you like doing art because you've never done it before, doing some environmental art is a way that you can go and get engaged with the outdoors and you don't have to have really any art skills you just have to use your imagination so after watching this video if you maybe have a different perspective or a different thought about art in the park um, put up your hand and let me know Lisa, go I ahead thought, i thought that it would be like drawing stuff in in the park yeah so you can absolutely draw stuff, right? So you can always just take your sketchbook or maybe even an app on your iPad and go outside and draw and be inspired by nature. But this is a great way that you can actually just engage, like get your hands dirty and really engage with nature. In that short video, Helen talks about Andy Goldsworthy. She is somebody that comes up a lot when we talk about environmental art. She's a very famous British sculpture who, like Helen said, she showed several photos of his uh, work over in England. And um, he gets inspired by nature. He picks up found objects around him. And like the snow, the ice, the red leaves, the branches, and creates art with him. Here is some even like bigger examples. So this is a man named Niels Udu, who's a German artist. He moved, he was a painter, but in the 1960s, he decided to get inspired by nature as well. And these are some of his examples of these massive environmental art sculptures. So you can see that he's only using natural, natural material, branches, flowers, leaves. And these projects would take days or weeks or months to complete, but they will eventually decompose over time. So they'll eventually just fade back into nature without leaving any waste or anything in the environment that it doesn't belong. Um, so I do have to say that these photos, I just, um, I borrowed off of Google, so they're not my museum photos. Um, and we do not, uh, we're just uh, using the, the images we found online today. So if you're looking for any more photos, you can just Google environmental art and there's lots of famous pieces that come up. So here, you, you saw the slight change, right? Yeah, great. Uh, so here's a couple more examples of uh, Nils Udu's work. So we have a smaller one on the left that's just leaves, pieces of fern and some branches. And then on the right, there's this massive environmental art sculpture. 
So those he probably didn't just find laying, maybe he found them on the beach, but that would have taken a huge, huge project to drive them into the ground and create that beautiful piece that we see today. This is another example of a very famous environmental artist. See, her name is Agnes Skinner. She's a Hungarian woman who's often referred to as the grandmother of environmental art because she was one of the first people who created these huge natural sculptures. So on the left there, we have a very famous piece of her. Which, now that's not all natural. That's a, it's a giant garden box is what that is. But they built that in a way that it's beautiful art to enjoy in the park but it promotes nature. It's a place so they can plant and grow other, other natural, other environmental objects like uh, the trees and the plants and the flowers. And then on the right, if you were to Google and Agnes Senes, you're going to see this picture, which is simply just a field of wheat. I had to do a little bit of research as to why this one was significant. But what she did is she took a piece of land in New York City. This was in the 1980s. And New York City land, like Vancouver, he probably even much worse, is so expensive and it's covered by multi-million dollar office towers and there's Wall Street and there's so much money in New York. But she, she acquired some land. It was on a landfill, it was on a dump so on, uh, where they would put their trash. And she decided to repurpose it into a field of wheat. So for her, that was art because she was providing the symbolism of having something grow out of the trash, but also simply just a beautiful field of wheat in an area that is typically office towers and condos and construction. And then this is a different, a very different take on environmental art. So if you were to do a little internet search in environmental art, you're going to find things, examples of what we talked about, which is the picking up branches and leaves and creating art from nature. But you'll also find art that's more of a statement. Like they're saying, look, we need to create art that are going to make us think more about the environment. Think about how we can take care of the environment and what we're putting back into the environment. And I, I've even seen some examples of this type of work, not by Benjamin Wong, but by some local artists around Vancouver where they're using trash to create art. So on the left, there's this beautiful photograph of a mermaid laying in water. But if you look very, very closely, that is actually all plastic bottles. So that's the statement in showing how our plastics are invading the ocean and damaging the environment. And on the right is probably one of the most interesting pieces I've ever seen, which is laptops. It was a piece of art created by electronic waste. So here, this artist is saying, this is some waste that we're putting into the environment and how can we reuse it, but also teach people that we need to think about what we're wasting and how we're using it and what products we're, we're consuming that are not going back into nature, that are just laying around in the ocean or sitting in landfills. So now thinking about all of these really interesting examples, I want each of you today, and for those who are watching later, to think about how you might be able to create some environmental art. So either, we had kind of the two ends, right? We had, well, think about what you're wasting in your house. You know, like I know most of us are composting and recycling, which is, which is fantastic. We all should do that all the time. But think about things that you can't easily compost or recycle. So maybe one of your mom's old cell phones that's just sitting in a drawer or some old CD discs. Sorry, I know your parents have lots of these things kind of kicking around in boxes because they don't know what to do with them. How can you maybe create some art out of that? So it won't decompose into nature. So that's not the type of art that you want to just go put in the forest. But how can you use some of the old objects that are just laying around your house or sitting in boxes to create some art for your family to enjoy this summer? Or going back to the work of Andy Goldsworthy and those other artists, how can you go into nature? We're coming up into Canada Day. There's your summer holidays now. I know things are very different because we don't, you know, most of us aren't going to day camps or summer programs. So 
Hopefully we'll all be outside enjoying nature as much as we can. So I'd like each of you to think about, instead of just going for a nature walk, how can we get creative? But there are some things that we need to remember if we're going to do environmental art. Can you think about some of those rules that Helen talked about? Put your hand up if you can think about one of the things that Helen said, well, we should make sure we do this. Go ahead, Lacey. Um, she said that we have to stay on the trails and make sure we don't like destroy the, the nature environment. Ab absolutely. So if you're going out into the nature to explore and to try to create some own environmental art, you want to stay on the path. So you want to follow all of the rules of the parks, right? Because we don't want to hurt the park. We want to respect nature as much as possible. So even now, that involves social distancing. So all of those giant signs we see. I know I was walking through Deer Lake Park in Burnaby yesterday, and they've, they have a one-way rule now to try to control traffic. So you want to respect all of the park rules so that everyone can enjoy the park safely. But if you're going to create some environmental art, you only want to use objects that you find naturally. So you don't want to destroy any nature. You don't want to hurt nature. So you could go around the path with maybe a nice cloth shopping bag and pick up some branches you find or maybe some old leaves. So careful, like Helen said, if you're not sure and if it can hurt you, you know, you want to be careful because there is some poisonous plants out there. Make sure you do some research as to what you can find in your area or ask the adults if you're not sure. But you can pick up any, anything that's fallen off of a tree or blown up in the ocean some seashells perhaps, but you're going to handle it very carefully and very respectfully because you don't want to destroy habitats, right? So sometimes seashells might have a crab living in there. But then you're going to use those objects that you found to create some piece of art that you can get creative. And you don't need any art skills for this. You just need to pick up some objects and think about, hmm, do they bend? Are they stiff? Do they maybe blow in the breeze? Can I click them together in a way like Helen did in her piece. And then you're going to create something that you can enjoy, but the other people in the park can enjoy too. But then when you're creating this, you also want to think, is this eventually going to fade away? So if you're having a hard time assembling it, don't go get some glue or pull out some string because you want to keep it natural. So use the limitations that those objects offer you to create something that's eventually just going to feed back into the environment over time. So, and then one way that you can make it last forever is you can photograph it like Helen did. You can share it with your family, you can share it with your friends, and hopefully you can inspire everybody else to go do some environmental art too. And of course, if you're not sure and you know about what you can touch in the park and what you can, it's just go in your backyard. When you're visiting a friend, you know, maybe you're playing tag in the backyard, but then think, hey, there's a bunch of sticks laying around here. Maybe we can make something out of the rocks and sticks. So I think that's a great way that we can engage with nature, but also get creative. Isla, do you have your hand up there? Yeah. Go ahead, Isla. Um, remember you wanted to talk to my boss? My boss would love to. Yeah? Yeah, about my grandma. Oh, great grandma. Yes, I know we talked about your great grandma a few weeks ago about the schoolhouse. And it's so glad to see you back too. You've got so much amazing family I history in Isla. Yet. Yeah. So it's so awesome that you guys have all of this great That's history to share with us. Yeah, perfect. Okay, my friends, we do have to wrap it up because it is 10 o'clock, but I also have to run off to another meeting. We have to go drive to Fort Lightning now, actually. So Thank you so much for joining us over these past few weeks. We will continue these sessions in the fall, but it will be Lindsay who's coming back as educator for the uh, Langley Centennial Museum. And then hopefully I will join you with another museum in the fall too. So um, go outside, play with nature, get inspired, and encourage your parents to go through those electronic bins. We all have them. Every adult has one. What are some things that mom or dad or grandma have sitting in a box they don't know what to do with? Because I bet you can make some pretty cool art and put it on your dining table for a couple weeks to enjoy. Okay, off to you, Haley. I'm going to log out because I have to run, but thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure. 
Awesome. Well, thank you very much, um, Shannon, for all your time and sharing all your information with us over the past couple months.